great to see everybody who's logging in and joining the presentation. A few technical things before we get started. If you have questions during the presentation, please enter them into the QA chat box. And please make sure to enter your details into the webinar attendance form so that we could send you the CE credit. Before we get started, I want to mention a new project that Blue Sky Bio has recently launched, a HIPAA compliant file transfer system. You could send and receive files. Um, the web address for that is biobigbox.com. Once again, it's a HIPAA compliant file transfer system. You could send and receive files at no cost. So we definitely encourage everybody to go check that out and to start using that. For today's presentation, we're very pleased to have with us Dr. Armin Mirzayan. His qualifications would take up probably the majority of tonight's presentation, but amongst many other things, he's the founder of cadre.com with the vision to provide every dentist with imaging services, peer-to-peer -peer impl implant planning, and high-quality implant education. He's going to be discussing tonight the process of exact implant placement. Without uh, further ado, I'd like to pass it over to Armin. Please go ahead. Thanks, Michael. Thanks for the invite. And I've been a speaking and lecturing for, what, over 10 years now, and you're the first person to ever pronounce my name correctly. I was absolutely floored. Thank you very much, Michael. Uh, can you confirm that you can see my screen? Yes, we could see your screen. Do you see all these perfed implants on my screen? Yes. If you mind turning off your uh, uh, your phone, I'd appreciate it. Uh, sure, hello, everyone. Uh, thanks a lot for logging in to watch this webinar. Uh, really, uh, this could be a week-long webinar if we wanted to cover a lot of things uh, that are involved in uh, placing accurate implants. Uh, I'm going to take you through uh, some things. And in the meantime, if you can chat or text uh, Michael, what exactly you want to see today. After the first five, ten minutes, I'll review those and I can highlight whatever specifically you want to see. It's a, such a broad subject that uh, I want to make sure I make it worth your time tonight. So we'll get started. The first thing I'm going to show you with this slide is uh, I'm not here to scare you. I'm not here to uh, for, be you over the head. Nothing I hate more than when another practitioner forces me into uh, doing something by scaring me or by telling me it is a standard of care. Uh, again, I don't, I'm not here to alarm you or scare you, but these are just some random uh, pictures. Most of these are actually taken in my office, and I'll start from the top left corner. This implant is perfed. I can feel it with my finger. This implant is touching the root of that uh, first molar. This implant is integrated past all my torque tests, but half of that implant is in soft tissue. This implant was, you know, another millimeter or two could have been disastrous. Uh, we can see the elliptical shape of the bone here. You have no room for error. You can only place in about a nine millimeter implant in this area here. And if you're off angle by a few degrees, either you're perf to the lingual or you hit the mental foramen. Here from a simple 2D image, you can see that this implant is placed way too close to the tooth in front of it. These are rather obvious. You don't need to be a radiologist to see that these are perforated. And uh, my, my argument to you is that we no longer can rely on panoramics and PAs. I would say between uh, all the imaging centers that uh, operate, we probably see three to five perforations a week between uh, patients that we scan who have had implants placed. Uh, so if you relied on this panel here and you placed the implant in this area, anything more than nine millimeters, you would have likely perf. And there's no way you can palpate this and feel for the concavity on the lingual and uh, be able to place an implant without possibly harming your patients. Um, these four images here are on the same patient. This implant is perf. This one came close to perfing. This one, I don't know if you can tell from your screen, it's sitting right on top of the canal. And this one, technically is perf, but uh, there's no consequence to this. So it's way too common. We see this uh, quite a lot. And in the years past, you know, just a few years ago before the options with Blue Sky Bio with uh, and uh, where imaging is now today, 
uh, most clinicians would not consider placing implants fully guided. Uh, it was quite expensive and it would be incredibly difficult to stay competitive with uh, all the other practitioners who are placing implants. But the converse of that is true now. Now you can very easily and very readily simply buy some insurance when you're placing implants. And the common argument I hear thousands and thousands of times from uh, many practitioners is this is not necessary, I do just fine. Uh, doing it freehand and the way I've turned those people around is with a simple explanation. Um, when you're doing surgery I want to be in and out of there as quickly as possible. If you're doing any kind of sedation or it's just not a pleasant procedure for a patient to go through. So the argument for those who are convinced that guided is not for them, the one thing I can guarantee you is when you plan it in three dimensions and you do the surgery uh, your procedure time is cut by 60, 70, 80 percent and your stress factor is dramatically re reduced. Granted, you can place the implant exactly where it belongs freehand if you claim so, uh, but, uh, but my argument would be, well, you can do it so much more efficiently and more comfortably and stress-free for your patients. And then those exact clinicians, when I follow up with them uh, somewhere down the line, most of them, if not all of them, readily will say they will never uh, perform surgery without a guide. So I'm not here to pressure you or scare you. Uh, it's very important that you do know that you have this viable option to you and uh, the topic or the, uh, the title for the presentation is that uh, we sweat over a crown and bridge with you know, over 30, 40, 50 microns. We obsess over it but we really don't care about millimeters in implantology and that really fascinates me. I don't know why uh, we always think we can overcome the misplacement with custom abutments or it's not that critical. I think it's even more critical in implantology that we'd be even more precise than, than crown and bridge. So I'm going to take you through just a, a very brief overview of what this entails and how you can get into this. Um, the way I see it, the time has come now that literally every practitioner uh, I will never say all because there are definitely some characters out there, but virtually every practitioner can place the implant exactly where it belongs with guided surgery. And what will separate clinicians from each other is how other clinicians uh, uh, manage soft tissue and bone. That's a whole other level of experience, a uh, whole other level of knowledge and expertise, but placing the implant exactly where it belongs uh, we can standardize that. As of today, everyone can place the implant if they follow the proper protocol exactly where it belongs. And that's pretty refreshing because if you're about to get to implants, you're going to spend thousands and thousands of dollars and maybe mortgage your house to pay for uh, parts and materials and uh, course curriculum. And uh, it's awesome that if you're just about to get into guided, this or into, into placing implants, and as you know, that's the largest growth opportunity for your practice for the next five, 10 years, you're gonna do this the correct way. Uh, luckily for, for the majority of implants that are placed in the United States, I, I've, I've read anywhere from 70 to 80% of them are for single tooth replacement that don't need any bone grafting, that don't need any soft tissue manipulation. So myself personally, I've done, placed multiple implants, I've done edentulous cases, but probably a quarter to a third of my cases are referred to a specialist for their expertise. And I'm involved in the planning process. I uh, design the cases for them, I design the surgical stents, and I make them use their surgical, my surgical stents before they uh, uh, when they do the surgery. So here's a quick overview. Uh, Michael, am I talking too fast? I have no way to gauge the audience. Am I going at a good pace? Am I going too slow? I'd love some feedback real quick. No, I think it's, uh, I think you're going great. All right, fantastic. So we'll give you an overview and it's very, very simple. What we need to do is uh, have two pieces of information. One of them is to have a digital model of the mouth of the teeth for tooth-borne cases. You can do this multiple ways. You can scan with a CAT CAM machine and uh, to discuss the advantages of one machine over another is another week-long project or, or a, a webinar because there's a lot of patent issues and different things that you need to be aware of, but we'll keep it simple. You need a digital model of the teeth. They can be intraoral or they can be scanned off stone models. And then from this CAT CAM data, what you do is you design the perfect digital wax up where you want your future restoration to go. And then from here what we do 
is we merge the two pieces of data. What you're seeing now here is the Galaxis software from Serona. Uh, we use many different software. The predominant one we use is the Blue Sky one, uh, and we'll feature that as well. But I, I'd like to show you the overview. Now, once you have the uh, data integrated between the CAT CAM and the cone beam data, then you start planning your implant. Now, when you plan your implants, um, you have complete control over angulation. You get to see everything in three dimensions. You get to see the path of draw of the implant through the restoration. You get to see exactly where the bone is and the sinus is. And if you follow through with this design and get a surgical stent fabricated, you can do fully guided surgery that exactly replicates this design if you follow the proper protocol. So again, a simple overview is we fuse the two pieces of information and then we start the surgery process and I'll feature many different lines and why I favor the blue sky one. Uh, but here's the process. We have a surgical stent in place and you follow the drill protocols. Every implant company now virtually has a fully guided system. It's a separate system than a traditional one you may already have in your inventory. But the cool thing is you follow the uh, protocol and once your surgical uh, drills hit the sleeve like you see here you have gone to depth so I no longer stop to take x-rays with guide pins to see if I'm on the right track I'm not stressing this is the easiest procedure I do in my office I sweat over class 2 composites way more than I do over this uh, guided surgery and then depending on the implant system you use you place the implant through the surgical stent, and if you're more advanced, you can bypass this. I just want to give you a very simple overview of how this process works. You place the implant through the surgical stent, and then you torque the implant into position. And once you bottom out with your carrier here for this particular system, your surgery is complete. You are finished. On average, these single units take me no more than five or ten minutes, and most of, the, most of that time is because I'm recording or videotaping the procedure itself. So that's a broad overview, and what I want to emphasize now is how we make these surgical stents. Surgical stents have such a terrible reputation because of the damage done to them ten years ago. Uh, I just read a quote that Gordon Christensen was in front of the audience, and he told the audience that uh, every surgical stent or every guided surgery is off by at least one millimeter. And I want to explain to you, hopefully in a very concise and clear manner, uh, why uh, surgical stents, if you do a literature search, you'll find plenty of articles that bash a guided surgery and say it's not accurate. And uh, there's multiple reasons for that. So I'm going to take you through that right now. What you're seeing on my screen is an x-ray cone beam data and on the right you see CAT CAM data. I hope everyone can visualize that there's a big difference between the accuracy and the resolution of the cone beam data on the left versus the CAT CAM data. You can see how clearly we can see dentin and the anatomy and all these teeth in the CAT CAM data whereas anything that's opaque in the human mouth with 3D x-rays uh, is uh, has some artifact associated with it. So you can even see the enamel on the incisor, which are virgin teeth. You can see how distorted the enamel is. If you have metal, you have uh, uh, root canal filling material, zirconia, they all have a lot of scatter associated with it. So if you designed a surgical stent off just cone beam data, which is how it was done 10 years ago, versus CAT CAM data, uh, then obviously your surgical stent wouldn't fit. So one of our first locations is in Beverly Hills here in, in California, and the biggest struggle I ran into was convincing these very high-end surgeons to use our services because they would all say, I tried guided surgery 10 years ago, and for every five stents I would order, four of them wouldn't fit. And that's because they were manufactured in this manner. Uh, so now we're going to take these two pieces of information and we're going to fuse them together and you can see the discrepancy between the CAT CAM data and the cone beam data. Uh, <clears throat> just to drive the point home so you can see this in three dimensions, here we have the cone beam data and we used to design the stents off of that. It should be very obvious to you that the stent would not fit in the patient's mouth. Lucky for me, all I've known is CAT CAM derived stents, and I've never had that issue or concern about accuracy, but uh, it, it's definitely out there. 
uh, and that's a, a, a preconceived notion that most of you will have. Whereas if we design the, the stent off the CAD CAM data, we have way more accuracy and a good fit. Now, it should be clear to you that a good fit of a stent in the mouth doesn't necessarily mean accurate surgery. And I'll explain that to you in just a second. Um, and let's go through this step here. If I play this, it will be extremely rough uh, for the audience to view. Let me just try and highlight it. Uh, first thing I want to point out that is a big issue for us when we're designing cases is scatter. So here, let's go back to the clusal level of uh, this x-ray here. And you can see the amount of scatter there is. And you see the radiolucency around this pre-existing implant. That's called beam hardening. But there's a lot of scatter in a lot of machines. And uh, here's the difference with another machine with the same patient scan. So you can see how much scatter there is in, uh, and how much variable there is in different machines and different cone beam uh, technology. So this is incredible amount of scatter. This is off a of care stream, whereas the first one I showed you was off the Galileo's machine. So what does this mean to you clinically? Well, what happens is when we fuse the CAT CAM data and the cone beam data, let's bypass this real quick. When we fuse the CAD CAM data and the cone beam data, when we get to this step here where we're looking at this from an axial view, um, let's get a good spot right here and let me pause it. Perfect. Um, let's maximize this. What you're seeing here is an orange line that's CAD CAM data and the white is cone beam data. There's no way I can verify that I've accurately related the two sets of data. I don't have uh, virgin teeth to see the CAD CAM data perfectly envelop the enamel of a virgin tooth. And you could absolutely incorrectly stitch the CAD CAM data to the Combi data. What that means is you could design the surgery off of this complex and then you put the stent in the mouth, the stent fits in the mouth, and you assume your surgery is going to be precise where it could be off by a millimeter. And you might have a, a, a non-favorable result. Um, Michael, I need some feedback from you again. Did I explain that pretty clearly? Yeah, I think so. There are a bunch of questions that are actually coming in. And if okay. I can interrupt you, I'll read some off to you. I'll tell you exactly what interrupt me in about four slides. Okay. okay so uh, now we have some machines uh, and I don't like to bash other companies, but this is an iCAT. When we get an iCAT, especially the older machines, uh, I would say people bought comb beams eight, ten years ago just to know where the bone is. Uh, but now you buy comb beams to do all this incredible uh, 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 advancements and surgeries and uh, really use the functionality of the comb beam. We reject more iCAT scans because we just can't work with them because of that scatter. And here's what I'm getting at with the accuracy. Here's a, uh, a, a video that shows in the Blue Sky software when we're trying to stitch CAD CAM data to cone beam data. And there are times where there's three of us, there's three dentists working at Cadre, we'll have a conference call, and the three of us cannot agree where the proper location is. So I'll show you this slide here. Uh, you can see how the color differentiation here between the, uh, the CAD CAM data and the comb beam from this image to this image to this image is different, and it's virtually impossible for me to tell you which one is accurate. So we take certain measures uh, to make sure we do this accurately, and about the, the best one, about the best way we can verify it is, uh, let's see, is this step right here. So if you look at this scan here, what we do is we, let's make this larger too, in cross-section or an axial view, we verify that the orange line and enamel are perfectly matched to each other. So there are often times where you just don't achieve this and your surgery can be wrong. In fact, if there are less than four or five natural teeth in the equation, uh, we generally don't trust the CAD CAM and the cone beam integration. We go to a scan appliance, and I'll detail that to you in a bit. 
Um, so it's very important uh, that if you're scanning yourself or you're sending it to an imaging center, it's very important that you as a practitioner keeps in mind if there are less than four or five natural teeth, cat cam integration may not give you the most accurate approach and you may have to punt to a scan appliance. What that does though is it definitely makes the process more costly and more time consuming, it's more involved, yet you get more accuracy out of it. Uh, so here's a perfect time for me to stop and uh, uh, answer those questions. So let me, uh, are you going to type them to me or are you going to read them out to me? No, right I'll now? read them out to you. Okay. If you don't have a CAD CAM machine in your office, how do you suggest scanning the model? Oh, there's many labs who, uh, actually many labs have already moved away from scanning your, uh, uh, from, from, ex from taking your impressions and pouring them up so they can digitize it. You have multiple services. Uh, this is a shameless plug. I work very closely with Burbank Dental. So you send the a stone model to us. We've got Cirex there. We've got all kinds of uh, digital capabilities uh, 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 at Burbank Dental Lab. Many labs have them, so we convert that to a digital format and then uh, uh, we take care of it. In fact, uh, what we do a cadre is you could be in the middle of nowhere. Uh, hopefully you have a combing that will make it easier or you can find somebody who has a combing machine. You can take the scans and all you do is send the scans to us a cadre. You send us the stone models or even a PVS impression. We take over. We digitize everything. Uh, we designed the implant placement. It's done peer-to-peer, dentist-to-dentist, uh, and then we communicate with you with multiple different ways. Uh, generally, I'll give, a, uh, I'll give you an overview of our website and how we do it there, or we send you videos or emails. Uh, Michael already mentioned HIPAA compliance. We're horrified of this big monster. Uh, so we do all the planning on our website behind a secure server so that only you and us have access to discussing patient confidential stuff. I'll give you a preview of that in just a bit. Uh, hopefully that satisfies that patient or that doctor's question. Okay. Um, some scan the model with CBCT. I don't find this to be very accurate. What are your thoughts about scanning the model with the CT? Uh, I have done every possible technique. I've scanned stone models. I've scanned uh, impressions in the CBCT. There's a lot. You guys know who uh, uh, who Michael Ravens is. He's playing with this stuff all the time. And I've scanned stone models, like I mentioned, on my cone beam. Nothing beats the accuracy of this. Now, what you need to judge is if you're just using it to kind of find a proper landmark and the ridge is wide enough and you can afford some error, you can certainly choose to use that. But if you want pinpoint accuracy and precision, I discourage you from scanning stone models and PVSs and cone beam machines. That's rapidly changing. We did this conference a year from now, that might be a completely different story. What you're alluding to is an old technique called a dual scan technique that Nobel uh, has had for a long time until this past year where you would scan the patient in a cone beam with a scan appliance and then you would also scan the scan appliance in a cone beam and then you would fuse the two. Oh, I won't even waste you guys' time. It's just the most ridiculous way to derive the stent. There's no question this is the most accurate way of doing it. Okay. Are you recommending or suggesting flapless procedures? A great question. A very, very common question. Everybody thinks that when you do uh, guided surgery, it automatically means that it's uh, flapless. No, you can still flap and do guided surgery. Periodontists hate flapless punch uh, procedures because uh, they feel like they lose keratinized and attached tissue. But why do we flap? The, the predominant reasons we flap are twofold. One is to visualize the bone. Well, if I visualize the bone in 3D, do I need to flap to see it clinically? Well, if you have a thin ridge and you worry about the, the edge of the ridge breaking off during your instrumentation, yeah, you may want to flap. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you who loves flapless surgery, patients. If you don't have to make an incision and place sutures, it's so, it's so much quicker recovery time and less discomfort for the patient uh, to do it uh, flapless. Now, flapless has its consequences. The main one is uh, I don't, I've never seen that keratinized issue or the, uh, uh, the attached tissue because what happens is that when the tissue heals over, over the next four or five months, you have all that keratinized and attached tissue back. 
But what can happen is as a tissue is healing through this, this hole that you made with a plug, um, and you put a healing, uh, a cover screw or a healing cap over, uh, you get the situation that you see with an operculum over a wisdom tooth where you can have pericordinitis and you have bacteria being trapped underneath that little hood of tissue. So you need to monitor the patient very carefully to make sure you get complete closure. Uh, some ways to uh, counteract that is you raise or uh, you place a healing abutment that's taller than where the tissue is. When you're designing in 3D, you know exactly what size healing abutment to order. The trouble with that for me is if the patient inadvertently bites into it, you're starting from scratch. In fact, you're backtracking. I've had patients over the years bite into the uh, healing abutment and damage the implant. So really, if you ask me what my preference is, I prefer to flap, put the implant. There's two things you need to skyrocket the integration success rate of your implant. So we, we all know this. One is stability, and the other one is to make a bacteria-free environment. So if you bury it under a flap, you put a cover screw, you suture it, and you close it, and it heals nicely, your odds of success have skyrocketed. So clinically, I prefer a flap procedure, but I do flapless many times. You just got to keep a closer eye on those patients to make sure the tissue heals over completely. Okay. Um, another question, you show placement of the implant through the guide. How do you know how deep to spin the implant? Oh, fantastic. When you, okay, so uh, there are many, many different uh, systems out there. I'll try and give you a broad overview in just a second. When the carrier hits the sleeve, one, you got to make sure that the stent is perfectly indexed and seated all the way. And we designed, it's a very, very uh, specific math. We design the sleeve, we mill the sleeves, we place it in the most appropriate position so that you can use the corresponding drill of whatever you're using uh, to create the perfect depth to the, uh, to the osteotomy. And then when you place the implant through the stent with a carrier, uh, when the carrier bottoms out to that sleeve in the stent, you have gone to depth. Now, one thing you have to make sure you do is once you bottom out, you uh, most people like to get their proper hexes in the proper locations. If you're using a trilobe type of an implant, you may spin that implant so that one of the lobes lines up perfectly dead buckle. What you must refrain from doing is just keep it from spinning because at some point you strip all that bone and you lose your primary stability. So you want to, as soon as you hit the stent with the sleeve, you want to uh, uh, keep torquing it until one of your hexes lines up to where you want it, and then you need to stop at that point and dismantle the whole thing, the, the carrier and the stent. Okay, there are two comments uh, that came in. One is, I prefer medical-grade CT scan and overall CBCT imaging. I don't know if you have a reply to that or not. Um, uh, I've got a few. I've got a few thoughts on that. I mean, it's, with everything, it's a fine balance with the medical grade CT versus dental grade. We all know that uh, the amount of radiation we shoot with our cone beam data uh, is uh, much less. I have no idea what this construction noise is outside, but uh, we have much less radiation with dental scanners than we do with medical grade. You get crisper images, and then the other catch to that is what I love about my cone beam is I don't pick up any soft tissue uh, landmarks and information. When you do that with a medical grade CT, all of a sudden the, the argument is you now you have more of a liability uh, with any pathology you may find in soft tissue. So uh, we have a few radiologists we work with. One of the radiologists, I was just having a conversation with him last week, and he says his work will skyrocket when he has to read medical grade CTs because he also has to take into account soft tissue pathology when he's rendering path reports. Uh, I'll, I'll keep it simple. Uh, one, medical grade CTs are way more expensive than, than dental grade CTs. Actually, I'm not sh too sure about that. I don't want to say anything incorrectly. I assume medical grade CTs are more expensive. We know that they offer more radiation. Uh, but you have plenty of uh, good machines that reduce the radiation. That's the primary reason we have the Galileo's machine in all of our imaging centers. They have this thing called uh, metal artifact reduction software, which I already showed you two scans of the same patient where one had a lot more scatter than the other, and the Galileo's is notorious for that. And if it's a scatter that you're concerned about, if you have less than four or five natural teeth, then you punt to a scan appliance. Okay. There's a Does comment. that satisfy their question? I believe so. 
Um, a comment that came in from a 15 plus year periodontist recommending not to do flapless says there's often discrepancies in the bone level that you will not see in the skin. Uh, well, personally, I actually like to place the implant about a millimeter, millimeter and a half, or two millimeters subcrestal. Uh, I'll keep it simple. If you want to flap, flap. Uh, I, th I think the advantages of flapping is more than the advantages of just doing a tissue punch. Uh, but like I said, uh, simplicity's sake and patient comfort, uh, flapless uh, is what some doctors prefer. Completely up to you. I encourage you to flap. Okay. How do you do a flap procedure and securely place the guide at the same time? Uh, that is a great question. So a couple of things I've learned the hard way. I used to pride myself on the fact that I can just numb the crest of the ridge when I'm giving the anesthetic. Uh, what that does now for me is actually when you see the tissue blanch right at the crest, uh, you're actually occluding blood flow. So if you start, if you occlude blood flow right at the crest of the ridge with the tissue and you flap it, uh, you just deprive itself m uh, multiple ways of receiving enough blood and oxygen. So I prefer blocks now. And if you're placing the, I, I've had this happen to me where I flapped the tissue and I wasn't paying attention and my stent for the procedure for three implants was crushing the tissue the whole time. When I lifted the stent off, it was completely cyanotic and black and blue. So you absolutely want to take care uh, to make sure that your stent is relieved of the, of the flap. And that's actually easier to do than you think. You just take an acrylic burr to it and you trim it back and you verify that the tissue is displaced of the stent and is clear of the stent during surgery. Great question. Is irrigation overheating the bone an issue with the stent? Um, that, is, that is a known issue. You want to use a pumping action. So even if you're not using a stent, I like to, when I'm using the drill, well, I actually haven't done anything freehand in seven years now. Uh, I like to do a pumping action where you drill for a couple of millimeters, a millimeter or two, you take the, the, the drill out of the sleeve completely and make sure all the irrigation is going into the osteotomy and then uh, you proceed to go in increments. You never want to drive the drill all the way through in one sweeping fashion. Okay, uh, there's a question about pricing for surgical guides. I don't know if you're going to touch on that later. How much does the CAD CAM and stent cost at Burbank Dental Lab? Uh, fantastic question. So. Uh, here's one thing I did. Uh, I was convinced that the majority of people refuse to place uh, a stent or utilize a stent for single units because it was so costly. But with the advent of what you guys have done at Blue Sky and where everything's going, uh, let's say you're a dentist who does not uh, want to do any of the design stuff. You, let's just say you want us to hold your hand through the whole process. You send us the uh, Comb beam data, you send us a stone model. Uh, a cadre, a dentist designs it for 100 bucks. We design the whole thing. You take over, you uh, uh, approve the placement of the implant, or you modify it, then Burbank makes you uh, a stent for $100 with rings in it for whatever system. That's for, for a single unit, then you would pay $200. For people who take our Blue Sky courses, um, you can just directly, if you do all the design and we don't have to spend time doing the design for you, which is what we actually prefer, then you have a portal, you send your cases to Burbank and they would uh, print it for you for a hundred bucks for a single unit with FDA approved material and with rings for whatever system you want. Uh, two or more units on tooth porn cases, we charge 150 to design and Burbank charges 200, so 350 total. If you're a graduate of our courses, you can directly use Burbank. They will not print it for you because uh, their, their liability skyrockets to get it directly from you without us being a barrier there. So multiple implants, doesn't matter, two or five, you get it for 200 bucks with FDA-approved material and rings. Uh, and then edentulous cases, which I was going to get to next, uh, would be uh, we charge uh, $250 for the design. It's so time consuming and Burbank charges $300 for the stent, but we have a great solution for edentulous cases. All this is all, by the way, on cadre. And Mike, if you'd be kind enough to let me know when we have 10, 15 minutes left in the presentation so I can show the site, I would greatly appreciate it. Sure, no problem. I think you've actually cleared the deck of questions for now, so I uh, plan awesome. on the presentation. All right, next is, uh, uh, let's go through this here. Um, let's go through um, 
a very important concept. Well, let me actually start here. All right, so we have multiple choices. If you currently have a non-guided system, you could get a pilot stent. You can get, you know what, I'll even ignore these. These are so out of favor now. No one orders these. Uh, let's just focus on these two. You can use your, let's say the periodontist who just asked me a question, if he or she has a Strawman kit, the standard one, we can make rings for that particular kit. Uh, the, differ the difference you need to understand is with pilot stents and fully guided stents, uh, with a pilot drill, you can get a two millimeter drill, create the osteotomy, and most experienced surgeons will tell you that they can uniformly take the pilot drill and uniformly expand in a symmetric fashion like this shows. When I take a pilot drill and try and uniformly expand it after the first drill for the stent freehand, I end up over here. I don't have the skill set to do this. An experienced surgeon, all they generally need is a pilot one. So you can get away with a pilot one. Uh, one really important point to drive home, with fully guided stents, it is the only way to perfectly replicate your design in 3D. Because what happens, like I mentioned with a pilot one, you can veer off track. If you use a super aggressive implant with uh, really uh, sharp end cutting ends, like a, like the, the two most famous ones are the Nobel Active and the highest end, and uh, the Biomax one from Blue Sky isn't as aggressive as the design of the uh, Nobel Active. You can absolutely veer off track. You can have an osteotomy, osteotomy go in one direction, and with enough pressure and, uh, and enough direction and backing it out and re with the cutting edges, you can end up where you didn't design it. So what I like is fully guided for the anteriors. I don't want any room for error for uh, canines and centrals and laterals, but for the posterior, uh, I can get away with pilots, or I'll show you a variation of that for a second. Uh, I want to make sure all that was pretty clear to everyone before I proceed. I know there's a 20-second delay, if I'm not mistaken. So chime in now if you're confused because it's about to get a little bit more complicated. No questions, Michael? No, nothing. Uh, there are, but not on this particular topic. All right, so you have a plethora of choices. In the top left corner, you see the Astra kit. I am convinced that that kit was designed by an imbecile because there are so many keys and heights and drills. Uh, it was, I think, one of the only ones available when I bought it, and there were a few surgical cases where I could not get the patient to open wide enough uh, to fit the stent, the appropriate handling key, and the 25 millimeter drill. Very, very difficult to use. Uh, and they're all over $10,000. Uh, you have a great option with the uh, single cut drills from Blue Sky. What I want you to avoid is this guy right here. This is a nightmare in the mouth. When you have to put the stent in the mouth, hold the key down, and you can see how long this drill is, it is an absolute nightmare. It's not an issue at all in the anteriors, but it is a horrible nightmare in the posteriors. Uh, so I hope uh, that drives a point home. That's exactly what you want to avoid. And the blue sky uh, single cut drills, avoid that. What you want to avoid are handles and keys. Um, so don't make a mistake. This is my proudest accomplishment when I show a doctor that that they were about to buy one of these kits and I save them at least $10,000 and millions of dollars, uh, millions of headaches with, uh, with using them. Uh, so uh, I think I covered that pretty well. Um, so here's what I like to do, whether it's with the blue, uh, blue sky bio drills or the single cut drills or another drill that I like to use, another set of drills are these cam log drills. And essentially the concept's the same uh, as with the uh, single cut drills. These, these drills, uh, the t two huge advantages over the uh, single cut drills from Blue Sky and these cam log drills is if you notice, you start with a short drill, go to another drill, go to another drill, go to another drill that's taller. What this means to you, one, is there are no handles and keys, which is huge advantage over the other kits. And the other advantage is that you start with a short drill, you go longer and you go longer and you go longer. This makes access in the ba back of the mouth super, super easy. So let's say uh, you don't want to buy a kit. I discourage you from buying any fully guided kits. Complete waste of money. 
if you have some experience. If you have no experience whatsoever and you want to get into placing implants the right way, uh, I'll show you how to do that with fully guided kits. But if you're experienced, like that periodontist uh, uh, already alluded to, and you already have, let's say, a Nobel kit, and you want to place the Blue Sky replica of it, and you already have these drills, and you have nothing else, all you would need to do is buy these drills, and you could use your current drill to use as the final drill to create the perfect geometry for you to place the implant. So here's an example of what I mean. Uh, let's say you wanted to place uh, a blue sky uh, replica with a white platform that's 13 millimeters long. We at Candre would design it so you would start with these drills, get the majority of your osteotomy done, and then you would uh, use your final drill from that kit to create the final osteotomy. So I hope everybody can see the video here clearly. I hope you have enough bandwidth. Uh, so here's a stem that we made. Actually, this material was one of the first ones we played with. It is not FDA approved to be used in the mouth. So we no longer use this. Uh, here I'm flapping on purpose so you can see how accurate this approach is. And we do this with the, blue, uh, the single cut drills or these camo drills, Sa serve the same purpose. So here you can see I've made sure that the flap is completely away from the stent. And now watch. You can see we cut out windows off that second molar. You can see the stent is not seated all the way. I hope everybody can see that. That is the number one mistake you will make during surgery. So you've got to pay attention to that like I did here. And believe it or not, this is so sturdy that I am doing the surgery left-handed right now. Uh, because of access. So my right finger is holding the stent down on the second molar really easy. And now I'm using the, my left hand to perform surgery at about 400 RPMs. You see the pumping action with the water coming through. And then we uh, keep going deeper and deeper. And what we've done at Cadre is we've tricked the, let's just call it a trick, we trick the software so we can place the sleeve exactly where it belongs so that you can do it in this manner. We have the osteotomy with the final implant in mind. So here I'm trying to show you uh, that you absolutely have to make sure that the drill touches the sleeve and it goes to depth. So now I have a monster-sized osteotomy. I no longer have a tiny pilot hole where I can get off track. So for, with these drills, with the, the uh, ones I already mentioned from Blue Sky, you can do this exact same thing, and now I'm taking that final drill. Now it's really easy for me to uniformly expand it and get to the proper geometry to receive the 5O by 13 implant, and then I just place the 5O by 13. So if you understood what I just said, you save yourself at least $10,000. If you're a, uh, an experienced surgeon who's placed implants freehand, I'd recommend you get the single cut drills or these cam lock drills. We designed them in this manner so that you can place the implant with whatever kit you have uh, in your library. Uh, does that make sense to everyone? Yeah, there are a bunch of questions that came in not directly related, but let me know when you want to uh, field them. Uh, that, that was a good time. Okay, where should we start? Do we cut off exactly at five, or is there leeway? No, there's leeway. Okay. How does your system compare to Keystone's Easy Guide system? Uh, Keystone uh, Easy Guide system, one, I don't think it's released yet, uh, and they do use handles. I'm not 100% sure about that, so please don't take my word for it. I will... I will Quite honestly, look it up now. I know the Keystone rep here in Los Angeles pretty well. In fact, I met with the Keystone people about a year ago about their guided system design, and I discouraged them from using keys and handles. But from what I understand, they're not even released yet. Okay. Uh, next question is, can I plan an implant using the XG3D in Omnicam, then just export that plan to Cadre for surgical guide fabrication? I like the idea of a $100 guide much better than a $500 one from SciCat. Does the Serona surgical guide data require conversion? Um, God, what is the best way for me to answer that? Uh, <laughs> let's do this webinar. Uh, no, I, I can't say it that way either. Uh, I would say uh, just be patient is what I would say. That's okay. all I can say. Um, do you prefer to do the osteotomy at 400 RPM? I was taught to do it at 800 RPM. Can you expand on that? Uh, 
Yes, uh, use whatever the manufacturer recommends for their drills. Uh, the the ones that I used were at 400. Whatever the manufacturer says for you to run the that particular drill, that's where you want to run at. Uh, if you've ever placed bike on implants, they run at 50 RPMs and no water, and you harvest the bone as you cleave it as you're creating the osteotomy. So always go with what the manufacturer recommends. Okay. What if the patient has limited abilities in opening their mouth? Doesn't the stent make it more difficult? Uh, no. The stent is about two or three millimeters taller than the occlusal surface of the, the adjacent teeth. And what you can do sometimes when you have limited access, let me show you a picture. And this is, this is totally up to you uh, because it does come with some risk. So let me show this. Okay. So let's say they had limited access, and let me make this a little bit wider here. What you would do is you would take a handpiece and you would cut off all this acrylic here on the side, on the buckle, and you would have to take a drill or your burr and cut off and create a, a what, a three-quarter moon shape or a three-quarter circle. So basically you relieve all this area, and once you place the stent, you can slide the surgical stent in from the buckle making access easier for you. Uh, I'll put it to you this way. You'll have more trouble at restorative than you would at surgery. Okay. Um, I'm still unclear as to what stops the vertical depth of the implant when you place the fixture. As many implant carriers are the, are the same diameter as the fixture. Uh, if they are not fully guided. So here's one. Most fully guided systems have carriers that have stops on them, and the stent, if you remember, is designed with all this math in mind so that when you drive this down, watch this very carefully, or it's the next slide, when you drive it down, you hit this. Here it is. So you have a carrier. Let me zoom into this for you. So this carrier, and every fully guided system has this, there's uh, the purple's the carrier, and as I'm driving it down, once that carrier hits the sleeve, like so, I have now gone to depth. And you want to refrain from going any further because uh, you would start stripping the bone. Is that an adequate answer? Yeah. Um. Somebody asked where they could get the Camlog drills from. Uh, you would uh, go to camlogus.com. Um, I'll detail that to you in just a second when I go on the website. Everything I've shown you is on Cadre, and you can peruse. There's so much more content on there. You can learn a ton of stuff on there. Okay. If if you're in the maxillary arch with softer bone, is it advisable to consider one drill less than the final drill or the drill only partially to depth with the final drill to ensure maximal torque? Absolutely. That's a great idea. But you also need to be aware of the fact that once you're placing the implant, you may bind and not seat all the way. So you've got to give yourself enough room for thought so that you can back out the implant, not panic, widen it some more with the drill that you skipped out on, and then place that implant. Okay. A common, I, never, I, sorry, I, I, I was going to say, whenever I, I have never been able to tell the difference between type of bone when I've done guided surgery. It's impossible for me to have the tactile sensation to know how soft the bone is. We all know where the soft bone is, so you anticipate it, but when you're drilling it through the surgical stem like this, um, you, you just can't tell. There's no tactile sensation. Okay, a comment uh, that came in, please highlight that by guiding drills, moving parts are used which need a bit of free tolerance. So a slight deviation is always possible and one never can think that the end result is perfectly as planned. Uh, I'm not going to argue against that. I think you, can, this, you can't get any closer to, to being perfect like that, but yeah, we're humans. There's no way you're perfect every single time. I, I have no argument against that. Okay. Um, those are the questions for now. Officially, there's another 10 minutes left to the presentation. We could go over a, you know, five or 10 minutes. I don't think that would be a problem. Okay. Well, I could uh, certainly... Um, um, I can keep talking because all I have to look forward to is sitting in traffic. So... <laughs> I'd rather do this. Uh, let's go through. Uh, let me take. You guys want to see edentulous things? Okay, so let's go through this case right here. Uh, now I use. Oh, sorry, I shouldn't have done that. 
I use uh, the Blue Sky implants all the time, and I've used them in lieu of uh, Nobel Actives. I've used them in lieu of uh, uh, Stramen. Oh, I'm sorry, Stramen. Os uh, I use Osteospeed, the Conus, uh, quite a bit. So here's a uh, uh, edentulous patient. The patient is completely sedated. Uh, and uh, actually, the anesthesiologist has a patient intubated, so uh, the airway is protected. Uh, so I'm not so worried about all that water in the back of the mouth right now. So what we're doing here is we have an edentulous stent made, uh, which is soft tissue borne. Um, personally, I'm not a big fan of uh, uh, bone borne guys. We'll that's another hour presentation. What I'm doing here now is I'm using the, uh, I've designed all of this, and this actually will help that person ask me about the carrier. I've actually designed all this for the Nobel system, for the active system, but I'm going to use the Biomax Blue Sky to place the implants with the carriers from Nobel. Uh, I would always recommend that you check with the uh, Blue Sky manufacturer about your prosthetic uh, connections. For instance, here, uh, when you use Biomax, the Biomax, whether it's uh, the uh, narrow neck, regular neck, or wide platform uh, Nobel replica, the, uh, the connection for all three of those is always a narrow platform. Did I say that correctly, uh, Michael? Yes, I believe so. Yeah. So what this means is the, fr the fr front two implants I'm placing here, I'm going to use the narrow platform. I'm going to use a narrow platform carrier. So here it is. This is the Blue Sky Bio Biomax implant with the Nobel uh, carrier, and I torque it down until it hits the sleeve. And now I've gone to exactly where I've planned it. So there's a carrier. You see how there's a stop? I couldn't go any further. And now we'll place the other one. So we're doing all in four on the upper. So here I'm torquing it down. I like to torque it down manually. And again, you see the carrier hit the sleeve. So when I want a absolute precision and I want it, if I'm doing a lateral and there's no room for error, I don't want to be off by a fraction of a millimeter, I'll go fully guided all the way. Now you're seeing the ramifications and the difficulties of fully guided with sleeves and keys. As you know, with the all in four, I'm putting a white platform one, and the molar spot, it's, off, it's angled by 30 degrees, and I barely got in here to do the surgery. It worked out just fine, uh, but what I'm going to show you is the, uh, the lower arch, which was much harder. So we place the, the implants on the upper. We'll take out the sleeve or the, the uh, uh, surgical stent, so we're done with the upper. Now what I want to show you is the lower. So this goes on for a while. The second to last one, you see me struggling with getting the key in, and I kind of struggled with getting this drill in. You notice the, these Nobel drills don't have stops on them. You can buy these little stops that go on there, but you have to keep track of them. You have to screw them on. So already you see me struggle trying to get this whole complex in the mouth for the second to last uh, implant. This last implant here, absolutely was a nightmare. This one implant, actually this implant on this extension and the other implant on the other end just kicked me in the kidneys. A horrible predicament to be in. I could not get the, the this goes on forever. Uh, I finally was able to move the lower jaw to the right and preload everything and seat it. Uh, that's the whole point of this presentation. I, I, if I did convey anything over to you is to uh, uh, not use handles and keys and start with short drills. So here's the immediate post-op of that same case with the implants in place. And here's, uh, those are all uh, blue sky implants and here's my favorite shot. Uh, I mean, I'm not a specialist. There's no way I could place six implants in the lower jaw uh, parallel like this. And we've got the implants seated and we're going to now place the, uh, where I'm actually going to use the same surgical stent to uh, place the, basically, a, uh, a custom tray. So then I use a triad material to secure them all. I'm obsessive compulsive, just like the rest of you. I want to make sure there's no movement at pour up for the lab. Uh, and then we'll just undo the, uh, the pins and take this whole complex off.
makes restorative super, super easy. Uh, so what I wanted to show you also, one last thing, let's go back to cat screen share, and, oh, I wanted to show you this one instead. Nope, long one, Armin. Um, we've got to cover, no, not jumpstart, how about this one? It was that one. Michael, what do you see on your screen? The scan appliance. I'm sorry, what is it? The scan appliance. The scan appliance, okay. So here's what we do with edentulous cases. Uh, we're so proud that we came up with this. Uh, it actually dropped the stent prices by easily four or $500. What you want to do is, uh, if the patient's in the proper vertical dimension with their current depth dentures, uh, this is... Uh, uh, de these are denture dupes done chairside. You all probably recognize the name Corey Glenn, who's now in our faculty at Cadre. Uh, duping dentures chairside has proven to be a very important and a crucial part of everything I do because it's so easy and cheap to do. Uh, we dupe the dentures. This is the old-fashioned way. One thing you got to make sure when you dupe the dentures is you extend the flanges all the way down to the depth of the vestibule because we need to know exactly where the depth of the vestibule is so we can place pins and anchor pins and secure it in place. If you're short of that, you just lost an important landmark for us to uh, uh, design and place anchor pins onto. So after you dupe the denture, you scan the patient with markers on there, you ship that to us to Burbank, and Burbank digitizes that denture. And then we uh, can... Uh, 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 relate the models to each other, and now we can use that digital denture to fabricate a surgical stent and get that back to you. So the total cost for that uh, would be $550, $250 for us to design it. This one you cannot design yourself. You don't want to. It will take you three days. We'll design it for you. You, uh, you tell us the implant positions are right, and then we fabricate a stent off of that digital uh, denture dupe and get it back to you so you can perform surgery. Okay, so I've covered maybe 5% of what I wanted to cover. Uh, let me just show the Cadre website. Are you guys seeing uh, the Cadre website on your screen now, Michael? No, not yet. Okay, so I need to go to back to the handouts and say screen share. And let's go to desktop. Can you see the website? Yep. Okay, fantastic. All right. So uh, I just want to show you a few things real quick. Um, uh, we do have imaging centers that scan patients in Chicago and a few areas in Los Angeles. But if you're not already on our website, you can click on for doctors. And uh, you have a ton of information here. Let me stop that. Uh, you can find out how you can use cone beam for uh, diagnosing endodontic lesions. You can uh, basically a lot of the stuff I covered plus a lot more. So there's a ton of information here. We have information on how to build medical for the surgical stents and your cone beams if you have them. If you're not building medical for cone beam scans you have in your office, you're leaving so much money on the table. What I always do with all my patients now is I know beforehand what I can build to medical and what I can build to dental. And patients love that we can save their dental benefits for uh, dental procedures. So if, uh, if you're a specialist, you're periodontist, I mean, everything you do from bone grafting to soft tissue manipulation, all that stuff is billable to medical, obviously, if they have good medical insurance. Probably three out of 10 patients of mine have good medical insurance. Uh, what we'd love us, uh, for you as a specialist to do for us is leave the dental benefits intact so we can do our silly crowns and composites and you tap into the medical uh, insurance. And the good thing for you is if you're in a network or you have contracted fees, you don't have any contracted fees with medical insurance. Anyway, I'm getting sidetracked. Uh, so the way you send us the, uh, uh, the information is you click on remote design stents and here's a little video that explains to you how to scan patients that are tooth born, that are dentulous, and you click on the appropriate case, and you have to log in, because again, it's all HIPAA compliance stuff. When you have an account, you log in, 
uh, your credentials are already filled in on this planning form, and then you fill out uh, what you want, and you have to choose what are you doing. If you're doing an edentulous one, uh, you your fee is 250, so our planning fee. So everything is spelled out here for you under remote designs and stents. Uh, then you have an upload portal. This is where you upload your uh, data to us. Uh, and then, of course, our courses. What I do want to feature today is... Uh, uh, I'll, I'll just relay it. When, when I got into implantology what, 15 years ago, uh, it took me probably two or three years before I saw the return investment. I bought so many implants and so many things that I did not need to tap into for a very, very long time. And my goal is to get you started so that you're profitable from day one, placing predictable implants exactly where they belong, by using any and all of our services. So we have an exclusive Blue Sky Bio course coming up. It's actually almost sold out. We have to add some dates. We have added a date in Chicago in June. I haven't published that yet. But uh, when you attend our course, it's $2,500. Uh, every attendee will receive full credit for that. What that means is you get $700 worth of uh, Blue Sky products that I've bought for you. Uh, you get four dental implants of your choice. You get two final drills and a torque wrench. That's about $700. The difference we make up with uh, implant planning. So what happens frequently is when you start out, you need, uh, excuse me, you need some hand-holding. You don't want to deal with all this design stuff and where the ring goes and all that stuff goes. So we do all that for you until you get cranky, you get going. Uh, once you're done with all that, then if you're graduated from our courses, you could take advantage of the fees of just Burbank. But then at that point, you're in charge of the design, you're in charge of the uh, uh, the ring placement and whatever system you want to use. I got to make sure you do it properly so they can bypass me and get it to Burbank. And Burbank, out of anything they do, they're worried about the liability of making you a stent. Uh, and that's actually one of the main reasons they need a stone model. They take pictures of every stent that's made. Uh, they verify it on the stone model and get it over to you. Uh, so our course is April 11, 12th. It's in beautiful Burbank, which is being very sarcastic. Great thing is you won't spend a dollar more than you have to. You're going to stay in your room after the course to decompress. And then uh, we're just five, six blocks from Burbank Airport. Very easy for you to get to if you're in the southwest. You're flying international. We have a doctor coming from Canada uh, or from the East Coast. You want to uh, fly into LAX. Whatever you do, do not land between 4 and 7 p.m. at LAX on Friday. Either come late or come early. There's a ton more information for you. I'd recommend you uh, uh, register on Cadre. We charge a $30 fee for you to register simply because all day long I get 500, 600 emails of people asking me questions and quite frankly I get abused so it's really quite honestly a filter for me to know who's serious about using our services and who's just draining my energy. <laughs> all right Michael that kind of uh, wraps up uh, what, uh, what I wanted to present. There's so much more information. Every guided system is uh, explained here. We have a ton of videos on guided apicoectomies, sinus lifts, uh, doing them guided, uh, all the different uh, um, fully guided systems are detailed here. Oh, maybe I'll show this. Somebody asked about cam lock. So when you click on cam lock, I explain to you how it works. I show you how to use it just like the blue sky drills uh, for creating your osteotomy. And here's what I wanted to see. The cam lock 4.3 drill has a diameter of 3.4 at the apex and 3.85. So you would use that drill to create that monster osteotomy. And if you want to use a 5-0 implant of, that's a Biomax, then you would take the final drill, just like Blue Sky teaches you, to widen the osteotomy and uh, uh, place your implant of choice. So everything is spelled out here. Uh, and then we have a discussion forum I just launched. So a lot of the stuff, uh, you can ask all kinds of questions about uh, the any system you want but from here is where we discuss the cases and plan for you so uh, it's behind a secure server and uh, you don't ever get an email from us saying hey the patient uh, the implant for number 19 for patient X is ready you get an email saying from us you have a message waiting for you in the document management section and that's where you go to discuss the case with us 
Okay, there are a bunch of questions. You have time to field some questions? Yeah, I, I, I literally have nowhere to go. <laughs> okay. Um, I send DICOM files, upper and lower models, impressions, and Cattery makes the stent. That's a question. How long does it take to make the stent? Uh, if you answer our question, I'll put it to you this way. You get us what we need uh, first thing in the morning, especially you East Coast guys. Uh, you approve the design as soon as you hear from us. Burbank, they're going to kill me for saying this, their goal is to get a stent out in four hours' time. So by the time you approve it uh, and we send it to Burbank, and once you're a graduate of our courses, you send it to them directly, we've done it same day here in Los Angeles for doctors, but I, I don't want to put that much pressure and promise on Burbank. Let's say 24 to 48 hours. Okay. What was the clear acrylic material for the Duke denture? Also, how many gutta percha points do you need minimum? Oh, fantastic question. So let's go back to that. Thank you for asking that. A great question. Uh, so a uh, when you're doing the denture dupe, the uh, uh, come on, it's installing. Can you see my screen or no? Um, what, do you, what do you see on my screen? The website. The cam logs. Yeah, the website. Okay, so uh, the denture dupe material itself is uh, it's on on the website. It's oh God, it's I forget the company's name. And you want to order the specific one? If you just post it on the discussion forum, I'll show you the link to it. It's dirt cheap, uh, but it's super fast set, and the whole process is detailed for you. Uh, and Corey Glenn came up with it um, on the on the website. Um, and it's ortho resin. Now you notice that I didn't care if my denture dupe itself was opaque. You see how it's, it was radiolucent because when we digitize this denture dupe, we see where the teeth are. What needs to be opaque are the markers. Now I discourage you from doing it the way I have it where the markers are flush to the denture flange. I prefer that these are buttons that come out. You can buy radiographic markers. Uh, they're pretty inexpensive and literally glue them onto this. Uh, or you can just take, everyone has expired resin cement. Instead of making it flush to the flange here, uh, I recommend you actually have them bulging out. It makes it easier for when we relate the CAT CAM data or the denture data to the combing data. Also, uh, most scans take good 15 seconds. So what can happen is uh, you could scan the patient perfectly fine all the way to here, and then the patient moves. Uh, so one, you got to make sure the patient is locked in when they're being scanned, uh, and you got to make sure you spread these points as far apart from each other as possible. I usually use six to eight markers, and what we do is uh, when we scan, we get to this step right here when we scanned. Let's go to... Right here, that was a bad, okay, so we get to this step right here, and we check each one of these markers to make sure that there's no distortion or double images. Double images are stretching means that the patient moves. So you gotta lock the patient in, and you gotta make sure they don't move, uh, uh, and that comes in handy at this step. You notice how when we're doing the stitching here, these are not so as pronounced as we'd like them. We prefer that they were more pronounced than they are here. Uh, the other thing you need to make sure you do, oh, I'm so glad you asked this question, um, is when you have the denture dupe here, uh, one thing you should consider doing is relining the denture dupe with uh, uh, either cold cure acrylic or even PVS material. You want that uh, denture base to be as tightly approximated to the tissue as possible, and then when you get the scan, not only do you check for distortion and stretching, you also check and make sure that there's no voids or uh, radiolucencies between the denture base and the tissue. You can clearly see that if you have a void between the denture base and the patient's jaw. Uh, it, uh, it's very readily apparent. That, that will lead to inaccuracy. So relining it, having spread out radiographic markers that protrude, and to make sure that the uh, patient didn't move during the scan is critical. There are often times where somebody submits this to us, we tell them to rescan it. In fact, we prefer you send the, the DICOM data to us first. We look at it, 
and will tell you whether to ship the denture dupe or not, as opposed to just blindly sending it to us. It could be a complete waste of your time and money. Okay. Are you doing the all on four concept, including pre-surgical prosthetic provisional available at the time of placement? Uh, absolutely you can. Uh, that's the, one of the reasons why I love uh, have partnered up with, uh, with Burbank Dental. So Burbank Dental, uh, particularly this is what we call, uh, uh, cover at our courses, Burbank Dental uh, can give you a hybrid that has no surprises for a flat fee of about 2300 doesn't matter the number of implants, there's just never a surprise for you. So my first big hybrid case, which I did on my father about 10 years ago, uh, I end up paying six grand in lab bills, and I learned very quickly not knowing what your lab bill is could be disastrous. So that's the whole point of the course. We take you from A to Z. Now, in terms of having uh, uh, getting you a model with lab analogs in them that uh, is mock surgery uh, so that after the placement you place the prosthetic, uh, the only way you could do that, uh, it's very intricate. You must make sure that the surgery is done fully guided. Remember, I told you, fully guided is the only way to replicate the design. So if you do fully guided multiple implant placements, um, then we can make you a prosthesis that you could immediately uh, place afterwards. Uh, what does get, it gets quite tricky because uh, uh, you also have to keep track of the hexes, and that's pretty hard to do at surgery. You're keeping track of so many things, let alone the indexing. So what I actually recommend you do is get non-engaging abutments or have a prosthesis made that's hollow where the abutments are, uh, just, just so you land in the vicinity and just quickly reline it with acrylic and pick up those abutments. Uh, that's probably a safer way to go than exhausting your energy and serious costs to have that pre-made? That's a very intricate question you asked and probably take me three hours to explain it in person in lecture. Okay, uh, comment that came in regarding lateral access windows can be designed with the guide to get the drills in place with limited opening. Uh, we prefer you take a handpiece to that because once we touch it ourselves, uh, we compromise the stability of the of the sleeve in the sense that it's no longer supported by acrylic 360 degrees, right? So it's not as sturdy and last thing we want to do is be responsible for it popping off or breaking, uh, so we prefer you did that. I do that quite often myself clinically. I've never run into that issue, but we don't ever want to send it to you in that fashion. But there are now some kits, some guided systems like uh, the new Astra Nebo system that has that already built in. But I've been doing it that way because of the old Astra system. I hated that. It was impossible to gain access. So I would cut the sleeve and the stent myself with a handpiece to give me the access. But we will not send it to you that way. We don't want a, a, an angry phone call from you of how the sleeve popped out. Okay, um, that pretty much took care of the questions that were submitted. Um, let me just review a couple of technical things I mentioned at the beginning. First of all, everybody should make sure to enter their information into the webinar attendance form so that we can send you the CE credits for the presentation. Um, if anybody has any final questions, you can enter them into the chat box. Yeah, I'd love some feedback, guys. Okay, while you're typing in your feedback, once again, I'd like to mention BioBigBox, a HIPAA-compliant file transfer system. You can send files and receive files to anybody, from anybody, and you could get started at no cost. Um, we'd be happy to see any comments or feedbacks. You guys want to type them into the chat box, that would be great. Or you could email me, armin at cadre. Cadre has a hyphen, C-A-D hyphen ray dot com. And if anybody hasn't yet downloaded the Blue Sky Plan treatment planning software, please do that from our website, blueskybio.com. You can download it, of course, at no cost, install on as many computers as you like. And we're constantly releasing updates and new features and functionalities, so stay uh, tuned and connected to what's going on. All right, doesn't look like any chats are coming through. Michael, please crop out that document management section that revealed patient-sensitive information. And okay. I appreciate the opportunity. Doesn't look like anyone's chatting. Here, we got a nice job on an overview. Thanks, great lecture.
seems like people are starting to send in some comments. Okay. Um, I can't see the comments in the chat box. I'll wait for you to... Uh, uh, here talk. you go. Um, can you suggest courses or websites to learn to read CT scans? Another question that came in. Uh, I guess the easiest way I would uh, answer that is, uh, one, you can see that on cadre for sure. Uh, and uh, it's just like reading a panel. After a while, you get the hang of it for yourself. And in terms of reading it for pathology, this is what happens to everyone. Uh, they obsess over the first dozen that they take on their own patients, uh, and virtually everyone sends the first 10 or so uh, to our radiologist. And I would say out of a 1,000 scans that we take a cadre, maybe four of them need to really be read by a radiologist. But some people like to cover their butts for liability reasons by having every scan read. It's $65 to have a radiologist read it for you. You can easily do that. Really, the easiest thing is just to play with it. I have plenty of content on Cadre on how to navigate through comb beam, uh, where the slices are, and uh, uh, you just play around with it. You can download the Blue Sky software, like Michael said. We have sample DICOMs you can download and import it there with anonymous patients and uh, kind of play along. Okay, we just received around a half a dozen or a dozen comments. Thanks, great lecture. Great presentation. Thank you for the lecture. Thanks. Could help. <clears throat> Excuse me. And finally, uh, one of them, always a pleasure, Armin. Thanks for what you do for the profession. Uh, Damn. I think that really sums it up. Who's that? Is that my mom? <laughs> could be. <laughs> anyway, um, I want to thank you for your time and for the presentation and everything you put into it. Cool. Very much appreciated. And uh, I'd like to thank everybody who's, who's attended. Um, to respond to a question, the link for the attendance form is in the comment section underneath the video screens. OK, so put your information into there. And Armin, thank you very, very much. And everybody, thank you for attending. Have a very good evening. Thank you. Thanks, Michael.